but we all think uh, so we want <laughs> you're pointing at each other so I mean might as well just pray for yourself but uh, <clears throat> but I would like uh, um, I would like for some of our ladies to come pray over Chana if, if we could um, uh, just some some things going on with Chana and we love her and we want to pray over her and uh, especially want to pray for her because she's just married to Bubba. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. It's a thing. Bow your heads with me right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time we have to be together. We thank you, Lord, because all of these needs are simply, Lord, they're opportunities for testimony. Lord, we don't have problems. We have opportunities. And Father, we're believing for these opportunities to be yes and amen in you. And Father, we're praying over physical bodies, be healed in the name of Jesus. We speak over the mind and the heart, be at peace in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we declare, we declare people to be free from their, from their demons, their past, their addictions, Lord God. We're believing right now for the miraculous to happen in this church family. Because Lord, you are the God that is above the natural, you are supernatural. And so we believe your supernatural power to be moving amongst us today. That, Father, you are touching your people. Lord, you've heard all the needs that are represented here today. And, Father, I'm praying and believing right now. I'm believing that these things, as we lay them in your hands, you're already doing something. Though we do not see the sign, we believe you're doing something. And so, Father, we trust you and we say thank you that you're restoring lives. You're restoring finances. You're restoring marriages that, Father, you are doing a thing. That, Lord, it brings your people a benefit, but it gives you all the glory and honor. Lord, may you be high and lifted up in this place and in our study tonight with our youth and our children and everything going on on our campus tonight. Lord, we're just declaring right now, God is on the move. And, Father, we just want to th say thank you. Thank you, Lord, in gratitude, not just faith, in gratitude, because we know you're moving. And Lord, we just want to give you the honor right now. In Jesus' name. Somebody love the Lord. Said, amen. 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 While you are being seated, let me make just a few announcements real quick. <clears throat> Next Wednesday, it'll be the first Wednesday in October, we're going to be starting a new study in here. And uh, how do you have, I'm just curious, let me put my glasses on so I can see your smiling faces. So I'm just curious in here, how many, and there, there's, uh, this is not to shame anybody because I promise you, you're not going to be the only one. Is there anybody in this room has never read the book of the Bible called the Song of Solomon or the Song of Psalms? You've never read it, never read it, never read it. Okay. It's one of those parts of the Bible we just overlook, we skip over, we don't think much of it. But I'm telling you, it's one of the most beautiful books because it not only deals with marriage, but all relationships. But there's a particular place in there where it's dealing with Christ and you. Because have you know, you are the bride of Christ. We are. And uh, Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. And then it says, Wives, love your husbands. Uh, because uh, just as the church does for Christ. And uh, there's a beautiful picture in there from Ephesians there in the Song of Solomon of, of us and Jesus Christ. So we're going we're gonna to start into that. So I'm going to ask you, this is your homework. Is uh, We're going to start with chapter 1. So your homework between now and next Wednesday is you got to read the first chapter of the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. It, it goes by two different titles depending on which Bible you have. So Song of Solomon, you're going to read the first chapter and then we're going to go over it. Uh, we'll be doing a chapter by chapter study of this book. I actually took that a study of it. It was a graduate level study uh, some years back, and it was fascinating, fascinating the stuff that's in there. The um, we do have some posters down here in the front. We have our fall fest going on. Thank you, Miss Christie. We got good things happening. I printed up a poster for you if that's okay. Did you have a poster? Where is it? Well, then forget these. You don't need these. Get the this is the this is the great value version. Okay. That's a legit name brand right there. Okay. So you're the one that come up with those. 
Yeah, but I like yours better. Yours is cooler. Let me see yours. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't don't worry about those. <laughs> this is so much better. This is so much better. Okay. So anybody needs a poster, be sure to see Christy. We have some around here on the front, and uh, y'all get one of those because they look much better than this hot garbage that was printed up today. All right. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> we have uh, quilting is tomorrow night. All right, six o'clock. Come out and get your sew on. The um, our ladies, we've got a group of ladies that are leaving uh, to women of women of joy, women of joy conference. Pray, pray for women to be redeemed and come back new women. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! I remember. I don't remember the. Uh, I remember the story of the uh, the old farmer and his son. Never been. Hadn't been to town in, in many, many years, and they, they, they go to this department store that had an elevator, and uh, uh, they, there's the son and, and the father stand there looking at the elevator. They're not sure what to think of it. The door opens up. This little old lady walks in, in there, hits a button. The door's closed. They stand there and wait, and after a little while, the door's open, and this beautiful young woman walks out, and uh, the father and the son look at each other, and the the old farmer father looks at his son and says, boy, go get your mama. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that blesses my heart. All right. If, uh, if you want to be a member of the church, we are having our members class. It's going to start on uh, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, October the 6th. We do have a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the hallway. If you'll uh, let us know you're interested so we have plenty of stuff. One last thing, the youth group is is uh, going to do a parents' night out where you drop off the kids here, then you go out on a date, which is dinner in Walmart. You know, I mean, if you're if you're really an adult, that's what a date is. We're going to dinner, then you stop by Walmart, and then you go home. But uh, on uh, they're looking at uh, this one says November the thirtieth. I was thinking there was one sooner than that. But uh, they're going to be doing a time where you drop off your kid for a donation. They'll take, they'll keep your kids occupied. Y'all can go out and do your stuff and uh, go have a good time and then come back. Come back and get your kid. Come back and get your kid. Uh, or they're going to they're gonna be on Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> Which might be good for you still. I mean, I don't even... Virginia's go over there like, Woo, that sounds good. <laughs> I just get rid of my kids, man. Uh, all right. Praise the Lord. We're going to be looking at a, at a few places. If you want to look in your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 16, specifically verse number 1 is where we're going to be looking at. I want to talk to you. This is a, this is a mature word for tonight. And uh, um, this is, as believers, God calls us to grow in our walk with Christ. That we are not to just stay at one level. we got to grow. Paul says, you know, what is going on with you? You should be eating meat when it comes to God, but instead you're still drinking milk. The old, the old preacher used to say it's a shame that people in, in the church, uh, they, they grow old, but they never grow up in God to where you have to part the gentleman's whiskers just to get the bottle into his mouth that instead of growing in our wisdom and understanding of God, we stay at a shallow level. And uh, so I want to take you a little deeper. Is that okay? I want, to I want to help you find deeper places because, because your dependency is not on me. I'm your pastor. But all a pastor does is I stand here and say, hey, you, go to him. Hey, you, go to him. My job is to get you from there to there, not from there to me. Does that, does that make sense? Everybody understands. So our dependency is on Christ, and I want you to be able to be a self-sustainer in your faith, that I am here to help, I'm here to give you an adrenaline shot, a B12 shot, but not here to take you by the hand and literally walk you your entire life uh, from here to there. So I want to teach you how to Find your anointing. Now, 
I came across an article. Uh, it's it's from a from a group called Scared Flightless. Anybody in here not like to fly? Oh, everybody likes to fly except two. Okay, I enjoy flying myself, and uh, uh, but there's a there's a there's a, 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 a internet site called ScaredFlightless.com. And I found this. It's an article came out in 2012 that started talking about when the masks come down. And if you've ever been on a flight, they talk about the mask. You know, in case there's a problem, the masks will pop out. Curious, has that ever happened to anybody? You've been on a flight and the masks fell out. Yeah. couple of you. Okay. Hallelujah, it hasn't happened to me. Praise the Lord. We... <laughs> First stop would be by goodwill to get a new pair of britches. <laughs> that would scare me half to death. That happened. But the uh, what they talk about is the protocol for making it happen and why it is such. Is that as a good parent, my immediate reaction would be to help my child and to help those around me. The problem is, is that the air can get sucked out so fast that blackout occurs like this. So I could put it on one child, and then I'm out. And everybody else around me is in trouble. And they said, what you have got to do first is take care of yourself before you take care of others. Because if I put it on, they've blacked out, I can still put it on them, and they're going to be okay. And it's one of those things where it's, it's counterintuitive to how we live. It's counterintuitive because we, we believe I've got to take care of others first. I've got to help others first. Do you realize you cannot help others if you are not helping yourself? And that, that happens in almost every facet of your life. It's more than just in the airplane. While it may go without saying regarding the spiritual life of leaders or mature Christians, we cannot lead where we have never been. And we cannot give what we do not have. Your job as a Christian is in very, very many ways, it's the same as my job as a pastor. We are disciple makers who in turn make disciple makers who in turn make disciple makers. I've seen pastors before. You're going to have a hard time. Just keep following me there, Brandon. You're doing good, son. Doing good. So I've seen pastors before where it's, oh, you need to come be a part of my people. You need to come be a part of my people. And then I keep you tethered to me. That you're doing my bidding. You're giving into my causes. When in fact, you understand none of you belong to me at all. You belong to Jesus. I'm here caretaking. If you belong to me, some of those sheep have been on a barbecue pit a long time ago. Hallelujah. You belong to Jesus. My job is to make you a disciple maker so that you can in turn go out and make others. Oh, wait a minute. That's what the book of Acts was all about. When the church started, there was no necessarily professional clergy what you had was people that were getting saved, leading others to Christ, and they were growing together in their faith. And so they were, you're literally becoming a spiritual leader. Well, how do you know you're supposed to be that in your home? The greatest, the greatest mission field you have at your disposal is your own family. And that you want to see your kids thrive in Jesus, don't you? I want my kids to thrive in Jesus, so I teach them how to do it. And so for us, if I don't have it in my life, how can I give what I don't have? How can I lead where I've never been? I do not know how to counsel somebody. Now, I can wiggle through it, but I don't know how to counsel somebody that's gone through a bankruptcy because I've never been there. I don't know how to counsel somebody through a divorce because I've never been there. Now, if you want to talk about how do I save my marriage, I've been there. If you want to talk about some other circumstances I have encountered, I can talk about it. Why? Because I've been there. 
But if I've never been someplace, I can't lead you there. So if I'm trying to tell you, go deeper in God, but I myself am not, who am I kidding? So as mature believers, it's got to be in us before we can give it away. Now, burnout is a thing that happens in every occupation. But it's especially happening in church. Now, part of, part of what I... Don't go, don't go to that one yet. Don't go to that one yet. Let me, uh, let me give you some statistics here. This is, this is burnout according to pastors. Okay, I'm gonna give you, Let me give you a glimpse into my world. Okay? Because what happens in my world often happens in your world as well. Now, in uh, 2010, this is some data material, but this comes from the New York Times. I'll tell you, it got worse than this after COVID. It got, it got a lot worse. 45% of pastors, this is uh, uh, out of the New York Times, it says members of the clergy now suffer from obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most Americans. In the last decade, the pastor's use of antidepressants has risen while their life expectancy has fallen. Many pastors would change careers if they could. Interesting. 45% of pastors say that they've experienced depression or burnout to the extent that they needed to take a leave of absence from, from ministry. 50% of pastors feel une unable to meet the needs of the job. 56% of pastors' wives say they have no close friends. 70% of pastors don't have close friends. 80% believe that pastoral ministry has negatively affected their family. 94% feel under the pressure to have a perfect family. 90% of all pastors feel unqualified or poorly prepared for ministry. What do you think about that? <clears throat> Nine out of ten pastors feel unqualified qualified and unprepared to do this job. How do you feel about being a Christian? How do you feel about your walk with God? Can you say, can you say, you know what, I'm 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 God's man or woman of faith and valor. I'm going to show you, I'm going to help you, I'm going to lead you. Do you have that kind of confidence to do that? The shame is is most churches do not have people that feel that way. Instead, we feel like, well, I don't know if I can do anything. Do you know you're a Bible scholar in your own community? If you've been in church 10 years, you're a Bible scholar in your community. Well, Brother Mike, I don't know that much about the Bible. They know less. They know less than you do. And so there's moments where we feel unqualified to do what we do. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month because they're burnt out. Now, something I really want to dig down deep in here is because if we're not careful, that happens to all of us. It happens to all of us in a church, especially you're here, here on a Wednesday night. That means you're usually got your hands busy doing something in the church. You're usually... Uh, uh, Helping out with this or helping out with that or wanting to be involved. And if we're not careful, we have, a, we have a whole battalion of people that no longer work with us. Burnout is a condition that occurs in ministry when we attempt to do the spiritual work through fleshly means for a sustained period of time. Where you try to do spiritual things in your own strength. Can I tell you this is a recipe for disaster. It is. Do you know how we should be doing things for God? How we should be living for God? It's like this. Dear Lord, help me. Give me your strength. Give me your patience. Give me your wisdom. Because God, I can't do it on my own. I've got to have you. I've got to have you to represent you. I've got to have you so people can see your light shining through me. Help me today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Do you realize that should be every one of us? Not just the pastors. Because I'll tell you right now, as pastors burn out, I see more and more and more church people burning out. Why? Because they're busy trying to do it in their own effort. Man, if I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, kids' ministry is not my ministry. If I can't whoop them, I don't want to deal with them. Can I get an amen? All right. Kids' ministry is not my thing. Working in the nursery is not my thing. But there are moments where I've had to. I've had to. And I'll tell you exactly what I do. Dear God, help your son today. Because I don't want to choke the life out of them. <laughs> you hearing me? I'm being real, man. I'm being real. I can't give what I don't have. Burnout happens because this is why it's notorious in pastors is I'm so busy doing, I don't have enough time being. And this is something I've got to, I went to the doctor today and I had my yearly physical. Hallelujah. Man, I, I, she skewered that vein today. And uh, got all that blood out of there. And uh, uh, I, you know, just to make sure I'm healthy. Now my doctor, I don't like him. <laughs> Terrible individual. So he's, he's, he's old army doctor. He, he, was, he was in the military. So he's like, He's got his little hammer. And I'm not good at, you know, you hit the knee, and I'm not good at that. My, my, years ago, my doctor said, you know, grab your arms and pull upper body, and it takes all the tension out of the lower body, and then, then it actually works. And this, this joker's over there got the little hammer, and it's not working. What does he do? Yeah! He karate chops me right there. Boy, that knee popped out. Pop, wow! He said, that's an old army trick we learned out in the field. Well, you're about to learn another trick, buddy. You hit me one more time. <laughs> but I went and got my physical because I want to make sure my body's in good health. He, he's like, all right, uh, 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 push against me. You know, pull against me. Do this, do that. And I, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. And now he says, all right, now let me see your hands. He said, now put your fingers like this. Yeah. Okay, put your fingers like that. Okay, now put your fingers like this, okay. Do you know what that does? I said, no. He says, nothing, I just want to see if you do it. I was, yeah, I was like, 1-800-REPORT-A-QUACK, you know. I, I was like, you ain't no good. I need to make sure my physical body is healthy. What do we do to make sure the spiritual body's healthy? What do we do? How, how are we making sure that I am good? That Lord, I am I'm healthy. See, we have to come to the Father. And we gotta say, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, I want to know that I'm healthy. I want to know that I'm healthy. And where it sometimes we get so busy doing. We don't spend the time being. Because I'll tell you, you're worth more than what you do. You're worth. I'm not just a preacher. My worth is not in being a, a preacher or an administrator. Uh, your worth is not in uh, uh, keeping the kids. It's not in the chuck wagon. It's not in cooking the food. It's not in building something. It's not in the sewing of the quilts. Our worth is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Out of this comes that. But too many times we're busy doing this that we're not filling this vessel up. And if you're not filling that vessel up and you're going and you're doing and you're giving and you're going and you're doing and you're giving, we're at the church every time the door's open and several times when the door's not open. And suddenly you just get tired and you're like, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore conference I went to in Orlando, Florida, Kissimmee, Florida just a couple weeks ago, they literally pay for pastors to go to their conferences. Uh, uh, they, they'll, they'll do it in Florida, do it in Tennessee. Um, the next one they're doing is in the Dominican Republic. 
Over 2,000 pastors and their wives will be there. How much money do you think that costs? All you got to do is pay to get yourself there and get yourself home. But while you're there, they pay for everything. Have you ready to become a pastor? Hallelujah. Ready to be ordained? And I remember asking them, because I've gone to a few of this, these before, and they have a foundation. They've got some big money in these foundations, and, and they're footing the bill for everything. And I remember asking one time, why are you doing it? And they said, it's, Mike, it's very simple. In 10 years, 9 out of 10 pastors will no longer be in the ministry. No, 5 out of 10 pastors will not be in the ministry in 10 years. 9 out of those 10 will not even retire. They'll quit before they retire. We do this to give pastors a retreat so they'll stay in the ministry. We want to give them a week of rest. Rest and refilling. And I'll tell you right now, that's... That's huge. That's huge. Well, you need that. Where are you resting? Where are you refilling yourself? Where are you making sure that you stay strong? What you do for God has got to come out of the overflow of what's inside of you. And if there's nothing in you, I will tell you, you're not doing anybody a bit of good. What happens, mom, dad, you're running, 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 and you're tired, and you're exhausted, and you're getting cranky. Look at somebody sitting next to you and says, He knows you. You get to that place where you're going through, you're, you're just a bundle of nerves and anxiety, and your children come to you needing solace, they're needing, they're needing love, they're needing attention, and guess what? You're too wound up to be fun. So what happens to that kid? That kid is learning how to be disappointed in you. Are you hearing me? I love you. I don't have my glasses on so I can't see you snarling at me. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're not helping your family. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're not helping your marriage. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're not helping Christ. Are you hearing me today? I told you this is going to be a mature word. This is a mature word. Because what God needs from you is not just your busyness. What He needs is you. When He has you, when He's filling you, and I'm telling you, I'm preaching to myself while I'm preaching to you. As God is filling me, then I can give. But if I don't have it, I can't give it. Had a, I was telling, who was I telling that to? Craig and Randa, I think I was talking to you about I went out to eat and I didn't have enough money to leave a tip for the waitress. Yeah. And it was one of those things where I served my own food anyway. It's a buffet. All she did was get me one glass of tea. That was it. But all I had money for was the food. And I'd been working and I'm broke. And I had to eat real quick so I'd go back to work. And I, I ate at the buffet and because uh, it was cheap. It was one of the cheapest things in town. And I left. And I paid, I'd already paid my bill. So I got up and I left and the waitress chased me down outside. And she said, what's wrong? Why didn't you leave me a tip? And I'd want to tell her, number one, I served myself, thank you. But I opened up my wallet and there's no money and I said, how much of this do you want? I said, all I had was money for food, hon. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to slight you. But I can't give what I don't have. A mature Christian has got to be able to adequately feed themselves spiritually. You're going to have to feed yourself spiritually. You cannot live on the aroma of bread that you serve to other people. I give and I give and I give. You're giving the bread when you need to stop and eat some of it. I remember when the Bible says, don't muzzle the ox while it's treading the grain. What does that mean? As it's treading, going around in, the, in, a, in a wheel, and it's treading some of that grain, some of that grain spills out, and it's under the foot of the ox, 
and the ox is able to eat while it's working. And it says, don't muzzle the ox. Why? Because as long as he's eating, he's happy and he's working. Sounds like most men. Keep them fed and they'll keep going. Hallelujah. Pat them on the head and say, who's a good boy? He'll keep going. He'll keep going. Don't muzzle the ox. Well, can I tell you, when it comes to you spiritually, don't muzzle yourself. Feed yourself. Oh, come on. Feed yourself. Because the Lord says, I'm here daily for you. Taste of me and see. I am the Lord saying, I am good for you. Come to me. Come to me. I, how many times have I had to hear God say, Mike, stop. Stop what you're doing and come to me. Do you know there was a series that I was just looking at it? 20, 2015. 2015 was a very trying year for me. I mean, it was one of those years. Uh, I, I wanted to put the plug in the jug by February. And 2015, God was dealing with me. We had built a brand new building, uh, um, working to pay it off, working, I mean, just working, working, working in the church, in the community, working for my denomination, working at the fire department, doing this, doing that, and doing that, and doing that. And God says, Son, candle only has two ends and it's only supposed to burn on one, and somehow you found five. You got to slow down. And the Lord said, you know, and I'm like, God, I got to I got to get these sermons, these eloquent sermons together. And God said, here's the rule. Here's the rule. If you can't put it on a post-it note, it doesn't matter. Your sermons will fit on a post-it note and that's all the that's all you get. You don't get pages and pages of notes. And you can go in there. I took the post-it note, put it on a piece of paper, put tape on it so it hold on there. I I keep all my sermons in three ring binders. And you'll see again and again and again these little post-it notes that just have just a little bit of stuff. Why was God making me do that? To be dependent upon Him. To be dependent upon Him. Because I'll tell you right now, as long as I got pages of notes, woo, I'm good to go, man. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like how I used to tell mom and daddy, if you got checks, you got money. Hallelujah! I got notes, I can preach. I can go. Suddenly I got a post-it note with, with a, you know, three points and one scripture. And I got on my knees every week saying, my God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but you're going to have to do something. And can I tell you, our church was growing that year. Good things, because we had just had a meltdown in the church. And God started not only healing that up, but the church started growing. Church started growing. Lost 60 people in four months. It's like having a church in Ding Dong. You're in the middle of nowhere, but you're on the way to everywhere. Lost 60 people, a third of my church in four months. Gained a hundred in the next six. In a place like Ding Dong. That was God. And here I am burning out. Here I am grieving. Here I am hurting. And God's saying, son, I got this. Because all along you thought it was your strength. All along you thought it was your education, Mr. Master's degree. All along you were thinking uh, it's in your own effort. When all along it was all about me. Oh, does that resonate with somebody here today? You do too much. You work too hard. Do you take the time to replenish yourself? Because if you don't, you're no good to anybody. And I'll tell you right now, the thing that hurts the heart of God is when God has blessed us to do good work and we no longer want to do it because we're too tired. Too tired. I don't know how many times I've been working. Man, a lot of my jobs, a lot of my churches, it was bivocational work. I had other jobs. And I'd come home late. The kids might be up. Daddy, Daddy, I want to read this book to you or read this book to me or do this or this. Man, I'm whooped. I'm tired. I probably don't even smell good. You know, and, and I'm like, seriously? But you know what? They're my kid. Are you hearing me? 
That's my child. And I want to be there for them. And even in, the, in my tiredness, I want to be there for my kids. If I'm refreshed, I'm a lot funner, Dad. I'm a lot funner, Dad. And if I get a nap, I'm a lot funner, Pastor, too. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 16, I want you to see this. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king from his son. So I don't need your help getting me a king, Samuel. I've already provided myself with one. But the key here is this, that underlined portion. Fill your horn with oil. Do you know what the oil represented? The oil represented the anointing of God. It represented the, the approval of God. It represented the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And what does God tell Samuel right there? He said, take your horn and fill your own horn with oil. I'm not filling it for you. You're going to need to take your horn and you need to go fill it up yourself. I want you to see what it's saying here. It's not just saying, get a little oil and put it in there so you can take it. No, I'm telling you, it's deeper than that. You need to fill up your own horn with oil. Well, that preacher, he just ain't feeding me. He just ain't bringing me a word. That preacher, I just, I'm just not getting fed in the church. And listen, I've heard that. And I've had some guys I heard preach. Man, they preached for an hour and I was done with them in 10 minutes. It's the truth. But can I tell you what God is telling us is simply this. Fill up your own horn with oil. You don't like what you're hearing? Well, how are you filling yourself up? Because if you're filling yourself up, don't worry about what else is going on. Love the way you're shouting with me. Fill up your own horn with oil. Bible study has got to be more than just in preparing for a lesson, a Sunday school lesson or something like that. It's got to be something that's lifeblood to you. I'm getting into the Word. My prayer time has got to be more than when I'm in trouble or I'm three foot away from the hole on the golf course. The people who are around you will be the reflection of who you are and how you feed yourself. All I got to do is look at you and realize what my spiritual condition is. All you got to do is look at me to reflect your spiritual condition. I know how I treat you because of what I see. You'll know how you treat me by what you see. Do you understand how that relationship works? If I want to know what kind of husband you are, all I got to do is look at your wife. If I want to know what kind of wife you are, all I got to do is look at your husband. You look at my wife's husband, she's treating him good. <laughs> she's a queen. She's a queen. Treating her husband like a king. I want you to learn that, and we're going to go through this real quick and we'll be done. I want you to learn the seasons of spiritual growth. These are the things that are going to prevent frustration and anxiety spiritually for you. Because I will tell you, it's not always going to be shouting on a mountain with Jesus. You've got to understand where you're at. There are days you're going to have to go through the soil preparation. If you've ever gardened, you've ever farmed, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't, the, the crop doesn't just jump up out of the ground. You've got to go prepare the soil. That's some hard work. You've got to break up the ground. You've got to get out the rocks. You've got to dig up the stumps. You've got to get out the weeds that have been growing up there. The stuff that just kind of sprouted up. You've got to prepare that soil of your heart. By doing a little what? Tearing up. There's got to be a little tearing up of the soil. That doesn't mean you're telling yourself, I'm so stupid, I'm so dumb. No. It's, it's about, it, it's not time to take it easy. It's time to work. It's time to get into that Bible. It's time to read. It's time to spend some time fasting and praying. I think fasting is a lost art. Come December, January, my wife and I are going to do some teaching on fasting. Because I want you to learn the art of fasting. Jesus didn't say if you fast. Jesus said when you fast. There's something spiritual about tearing up that soil. It's, it's a part of it. 
The next thing you do is after you tear up that soil is you begin the planting. You begin putting the seeds in. Once you've gone through that process of getting yourself ready, Lord, I'm, 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 I may be going out uh, uh, for a spiritual retreat. I may be gone for the weekend. I may be, I'm doing something in my life to get myself ready. Now I'm putting that word in there. Now I'm believing. These are, these are seeds of what I want to see grow out of my life. If I want to see generosity grow out of my life, I've got to be planting some generosity inside of me. If I want to see some faith, overcoming faith coming out of my life, I've got to be investing some faith inside of my life. When you plant corn, you're going to get corn. You don't plant corn and then get zucchini squash. God loves you. He'll never give you zucchini squash. He's a good God. Hallelujah. Throw that stuff out in the garbage where it belongs. Find redemption. So, you have that, that time where you're getting your heart ready. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm needing you. I'm wanting you. You ought to be, before you open up the Bible, just take some time and render your heart and just say, Lord, help me to understand what I'm about to read. And then I'm planting that stuff inside of me. And then comes the maintaining. This is the water. This is the fertilizer. This is the, the time where I'm, 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 just, I'm just in there doing it, man. I'm living the life of Jesus Christ. I'm doing what's got to be done. Woo, I'm ready for some harvest. I'm ready for some harvest. It takes time. Time. You ever see somebody, woo, they just, they're like the Pope, man. They're, they're, they're Billy Graham. They're, they're just incredible godly people. You know, this godly grandmother, godly grandfather. You know what I'm talking about? They didn't get there overnight. My pastor used to say, if your Bible's falling apart, odds are you're not. You get, you get in that Bible and you're just going through it. I remember getting a Bible one time. Somebody left it in the church and I opened it up and they had scrawled all through it. I mean, there was notes. There was highlighters. I mean, the, a pen factory exploded on this thing. Rainbow of colors like Skittles melted in it. I mean, it was just all over this. You know what they were doing? Watering and fertilizing. They were digging in. They're going into deep study. I'm telling you, God says, quit drinking all that milk. You need some meat. Get rid of that gluten-free stuff. Get hold of the Word. Hallelujah. You got to go from, and once you've done all that stuff, then comes the harvest. Woo, this is the, this is the fun part. This is the sexy part. We, we like the harvest. Get it all in. I'll tell you, this is where the good stuff's happened. That good harvest doesn't happen until all the other's been done first when I see churches that are blowing and going and blessed I think there was a time this church was not and the people and the pastor got in there and they worked and they served and they did their due diligence until that thing just kept growing and growing and growing and the harvest is plentiful why because the other things were done first but how do you know then comes a time when it's not so fun it's, there's no harvest God must have left me. No. Because there's a season for pruning. I can handle all the others, but the pruning and the weeding. Because that's the moment where God comes in and says, Hey sister, I want you to quit doing that. Brother, I think you need to stop hanging around those people. Matter of fact, I'm going to remove them out of your life. I'm going to help you overcome in this area. You're not going to be a part of that group no more. The pruning comes in. As a pastor, I'll tell you what that feels like. People leave. Opportunities close. Pastors think churches need to do this all the time. Can I tell you, this is not the mark of a healthy church. It's not. The mark of a healthy church is it grows, it levels out, and then it grows some more. And then it levels out. It's, it's like you grows, pack it down and sift it. Which is actually like a negative balance. And then you start growing again. And then you plateau and you stop and you pack it down and you sift it. You're getting that foundation firm. 
and then you grow again. What you find out is that as it that second packing, you're higher than the first. You're here, 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 here. And it's amazing to me how people stop and they look in their life and say, I don't see any good things happening. I don't feel any good things happening. Must be something wrong with me, or there must be something wrong with you, pastor or church. Can I tell you, no, it's actually very healthy. You grow. These, all these seasons have got to be taking place in your life. Some of them are fun, but most of them are hard work. And you have that last one that just kind of hurts a little bit. But can I tell you, when it's pruned, it grows better. Amen. Go back and reread where Jesus talked about the pruning. All those the Lord loves, He prunes. He disciplines. This is stuff that's necessary for us because it causes us to grow. It causes us to mature. It causes us to be strong. These are the same seasons. There are, there are some seasons for a fast pace where things are going. There are some seasons that are slow. I realized when I became an adult because I really like slow. I used to want the hunting dog that would go run around with me all over the place. Now I just want the old hound that lays down beside my rocking chair and just sits there and drools while I rock. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. You have some seasons that are fast. You have some seasons that are slow. You've got to learn the value of a good pace. Learn the value of a good pace. If you're living life, young mothers, young fathers, listen to me. You're chasing your kids all over the place. I know what that's like. I had three different kids and there was only one mom and one daddy. I had three kids, had to be at three different ball games in three different towns and there's only one mom and one daddy. Then it's, hey, can you take my kid? You know, One of my kids is not going to have a parent there. There's nothing I can do about it. That last one was Gomer Pyle. He just said, surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Wasn't planned on. So you're... You've got to learn the value of a good pace. There are moments where it's fast and it's furious. And then there's some days it's just nothing going on. Learn to keep that good pace in your life. Because I'm telling you, you'll chase your kids and chase your kids and chase your kids. And then all of you are tired of baseball. All of you are tired of rodeo. All of you are tired of basketball. Are you hearing me? You go and go and go. And then you're too tired to keep... And <laughs> they're all gone right now. I don't have that. I just got a couple of you in here. They're all busy chasing their kids. I'm telling you. I see parents that are wore out and wore out and wore out because of chasing their kids. Personal depths occurs when you create places of slower paces. You're going to grow deeper when you can relax. Okay? That solitude and quiet, you need to learn the value of solitude and quiet. I'm glad I live in the country. I'm glad I live in the country. Because then I can go sit underneath my oak trees and I can just listen to the crickets. Or get it, yeah. I put that stuff out there. I, I, I got to put that mosquito killer out there. The A meaningful devotional life. Get some devotion. I love reading the Bible. The Bible's great. Get yourself some devotionals as well. The Bible says that in the multitude of many counselors, there's wisdom. It's the same in your Bible study. Have a multitude of things that you draw from. It's okay. If you have an opportunity, there's a book called Waiting on God. Waiting on God by Andrew Murray. It's an old book. You can find it for cheap on the internet. But uh, it's, he's a South African. Uh, we're talking over 100 years old. So the language is just a little bit older than what we're used to. But I promise you, it's a deep book waiting on God. Where you're just sitting there being still. Oh, wait a minute. What did the Bible say? Be still and know that I am God. Not run 100 miles an hour. If you want to fill up your horn with oil you're going to have to find those moments to be still. And I'm not telling you that's easy. I am the world's worst. If my wife was right here, she'd be saying amen and preach it. I am the world's worst at burning candles at five ends. 
I am the worst at it. And I have to take those moments where it's be still. Billy Smith used to come in my office. Hadn't even been here all that long. Billy saw it. Be still. Refresh yourself. Why? Because if you fall over, you're not helping anybody. As one mechanic said, if you let your car down, your car will let you down. So here's where we're going to end. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. You as a spiritual leader are the walking billboard for Jesus saying, hey, live like I do. How do you feel good right now about somebody imitating you for how you live? Some of you are like, I ain't ready for that yet. <laughs> Getting there, Jesus. Not quite there. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Okay, so if I'm going to be like Christ, what did Christ do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus went out and He departed to a solitary place. And there He prayed. Do you want to know how Jesus was able to do the things He did? Because of this right here. This is where you fill up your own horn with oil. You get along with God and you take those moments. I'm not telling you it's going to last an hour. It may just be 10 minutes. But the best thing for you, as it is for me, is to take those moments and get along with the Lord. And I encourage you with this thought. When you pray, because some, some of you don't come from a Pentecostal background. So let me help some of you start your Baptist out. When you pray and you get all of it out to God, take a moment and stop and be quiet. Because if you do, God will talk back. Jesus said, John chapter 10, My sheep know My voice. My sheep know my voice. If I don't know the voice of Jesus, why, and this is, what, this is what you hear as well as I do. How do I know it's God talking to me? How do I know if it's the devil talking to me? How do I know it's me talking? There are three voices in your head. When you say you're hearing voices in your head, you really are. Well, how do I know which voice is God's? Because I've learned to listen to Him. My sheep know my voice. Oh, come on. Learn to hear that voice. It's the best voice you'll ever hear. Speaking in your heart, your mind. I've never heard Him with my audible ears. If I did, there's probably something very wrong. And He probably uses my middle name. Yeah. Bow your heads with me. Lord, thank You for this day. Thank You for the opportunity we have to be together. Thank You, Lord God, that You call us to be deeper in You. Lord, I want my prayer as a pastor is I want these people that You've given to me. They don't belong to me. They're Yours, Lord God. I want every man and woman in this house, every young man and woman, every boy, every girl, I want every single one of them to be a deep dweller in Your presence. I want them to be a deep dweller in Your Word. Lord, I would pray that every man and woman here would learn how to fill up their own horn with oil. That I'm proud to be a pastor and I'm proud to help, but the greatest thing that could happen is we learn how to feed ourselves. As a parent, I didn't raise my child to, to be dependent on me to tie their shoes. I didn't make them dependent on me to bathe their bodies. I didn't make them dependent upon me to feed them three meals a day. Lord, I taught my kids to live independent. Father God, I pray right now, let your sons and daughters here learn how to be independent thinkers and feeders of you. And Father, I thank you because it's who you call us to be. And I pray that if there are any here that Lord God are dealing with burnout,
They're dealing with frustration. They're dealing with just ready to just not do anything. Lord, I pray right now, let them quit operating in that flesh and start relying on You. And just say, Lord, it's Your problem, it's not mine. I pray for rest and encouragement for any heart within our church that deals with burnout and frustration. And Lord God, if it's in their marriage, if it's in their home, if it's in their job, if it's in any any part, Lord, they may just be at a place of life where they just don't want to live. God, I pray, help us not to be burnt out, but instead to be vibrant in our faith. Because Lord, this world is not my home. I am just passing through it. And I got a feeling the end of the destination is almost in our headlights. Lord, I give you thanks and praise for this good day. Be with each and every one as they go home. Keep us safe, Lord God. I pray that you would help us to have a good night's rest. Let us get up tomorrow and be ready to seize the day, Lord God. Help us to be able to spend that time with you. Soak it up like a sponge. And then, Lord, use us all day long, squeezing us out on everybody we come in contact with so that we can draw more in the next day. Father, I just thank you for this time. Watch over us and keep us. And Lord, we want to give you the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 God bless you.